The shadow of World War II loomed long. There was a desperate need to rebuild bomb-damaged towns and cities because, above all, people wanted a safe place to live and to bring up their families. In the 1950s, the government was under pressure to build new homes and started an ambitious building program. The time to look forward had come at last, and the British wanted everything around them to reflect that sense of optimism. Into the nation's living rooms and kitchens came bright new materials, man-made fabrics and labour-saving devices. For the post-war generation of homeowners, domesticity had never been more comfortable. But there were problems. Some of the new products and innovations they welcomed into the home were killers. With the aid of modern science, I'm going to search out these hidden assassins and reveal them. It is unbelievable. Just by burning that flame, we're going to produce a deadly gas. Yes, we are. The post-war home was the most dangerous place you could be. Welcome to the hidden killers of the post-war home. It's a two-storey, three-bedroom, 4,300-pound house built in the modern manner. Doors slide or fold, there's underfloor electrical heating and many other bright ideas as well. Gosh, isn't this wonderful? It looks so familiar, it reminds me of the houses of my grandparents. It's so exuberant and optimistic. At the time, it must have felt like living in the height of modernity. Little did they know how dangerous it really was. This was the age of boom and affluent revival, especially for the middle classes, who made up some 15 to 20 million of the population. They were richer than they'd ever been before, and they were spending more than they ever had before. Macmillan was right in 1957 when he said they'd never had it so good. What could be safer than a modern home? I'm going upstairs to find our first hidden killer, to the child's bedroom. Children now had rooms of their own and all sorts of newfangled toys that were designed to be educational and to prepare them for their future careers. So the girls had electric irons and ovens, and the boys had model aircraft and train sets and chemistry sets. Although the odd girl did creep in. Look, there's me. Yeah, I'd, I'd had the chemistry set as a, a it, was, it came as a Christmas present. And it was, it, was, it was only literally an hour before I'd uh, blown it up. 17-year-old Ian Findlay was experimenting with his chemistry set in the living room of his home. There was an explosion. Neighbours heard the bang and ran out to find that the living room window had been blown out. Ian managed to make his way to number 72, where Mrs K.C. Bell treated an injured arm, put him to bed, and summoned an ambulance. Chemistry sets throughout the years have reflected many changes in science and society, and never more so than after the Second World War. Young, would-be chemists, inspired by the apocalyptic images in the comics of the day and their soldier fathers, could not resist experimenting with terrifying consequences. Two 14-year-old pupils were seriously injured on Saturday when an explosion occurred while they were trying to make liquid oxygen. Well, this is the chemistry set. Oh, my goodness. I took my vintage chemistry set to Joy Ledger at the Bristol Science Centre to find out just how dangerous this box really was. So, 
What's most alarming about it, I suppose? Copper sulfur would definitely have a hazard warning today. The test tubes are so flimsy. They really are. We wouldn't use anything like this in a lab at school these days. These, heated with a Bunsen burner, wouldn't last very long. They'd melt very quickly. Bunsen burner? Yes. Gosh, it's tiny. And this would go where? Well, Into the... Presumably. Gas supply. The gas supply. It is unbelievable that they could actually have, and there must be some sort of tap to turn the gas on and off. So you've got the full force of the gas coming in that would feed the whole cooker, just going through that little flame. Oh my goodness. We decide to read the instruction booklet. Always a good idea. Only... There's absolutely no diagrams at all. And actually, I think it says up here um, that you will see there are no diagrams. So then you can be more liberal with your experiment. You can change the apparatus as you, as you feel. I, I'm just staggered at the, um, the lack of instructions. Um, the idea of quantities, concentrations, there's no indication of how much um, solution to add to each one. No a mention of how to dispose of the chemicals at the end. It's, it's just frightening. And there's absolutely no mention of parental supervision. Still, at least they are clear about what to do if your chemistry kit loving chum has a problem. It actually says here that if the clothing of the person is on fire, pull the person down to the floor or strike them sharply behind the knees so they fall. <laughs> Cover them with any materials you might have to hand, with rugs, cloths or carpet, etc. And then it says you will have used your scientific knowledge in the noblest way. You will have applied science to the service of man, with capital letters, and probably saved life. And it says underneath, science is never evil except in wrongly used by man. Many of the chemicals in chemistry sets were caustic, so they would burn the skin and irritate it, which of course would be particularly dangerous if it got into the eyes. Part of the point of the chemistry sets was that they exploded. They wanted to make these explosions and the bright colours to impress friends and make it look like a magic trick. The explosions could burn, set the hair on fire, set the clothes on fire, damage the eyes, even blind a child. And of course, Children wanted to share these with their friends and they'd think nothing of putting some of the chemicals in their pockets when they went out. And of course that could burn holes in the material and, and then in the skin or even catch fire spontaneously. With some chemicals, 14-year-old Ian Marori meant to stage some experiments with his home chemistry set. But he put them in his pocket while he went to the pictures with his mother. He was sitting watching the show when his clothes began to smoulder. A man sitting nearby wrapped his coat round the boy to smother the burning clothing. The accident was due to body heat igniting the chemicals in his pocket. Today, health and safety regulations are more stringent than they were in 1950s cinemas. So we are wearing goggles to do an experiment to illustrate how lethal this kit could be. Right now, in here we have the permanganate, which is the chemical we saw in the, the purple chem chemical that was in the kit. Neris Shah, our lab technician, is going to add glycerol, a clear, odourless liquid that might have been found in the home medicine cabinet as it was used to treat constipation and sore throats. OK. So what we're going to do is just make a little pile of the potassium permanganate in the middle. And then I'm just going to pour in a couple of drops of the glycerol on top. So it sort of looks like nothing's happening. Ah, there we go. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. It's not necessarily child's play. So it makes quite a lot of smoke and some beautiful purple flames. And quite a smell. <laughs> yeah, mm. yeah, a little bit of a smell. Oh my word. And, and, what's just... the, and that hesitation, that moment of it looking like nothing's going to happen is the most yeah. dangerous thing of all, isn't it? Well, if I was a child, I'd have moved on to something else by then. Neris only used a small amount of potassium permanganate and a drop of glycerol. Imagine if we'd been more liberal in the amounts we used. A warning was sounded at an Epsom inquest today that there are grave dangers in letting children play with chemicals which are in themselves harmless, but in combination may be fatal. John Jesty, aged 15, died in hospital from injuries received in an explosion which also injured a boy companion. 
Unsurprisingly, the American chemistry kits were even more spectacular. There was even an American chemistry set that included uranium dust and a mini Geiger counter so that children could do experiments and measure the radiation. The company didn't stop making it because of the dangers of the dust. It just didn't sell very well. Uranium actually wasn't very exciting. It didn't explode and have puffs of smoke and nobody wanted to buy it. Eventually, new laws came in which required the kits to be non-explosive and non-toxic. But it's worth remembering what the chemistry set manufacturers used to say. Experimenter today, scientist tomorrow. But I think the really interesting thing about chemistry sets, if you interview eminent scientists nowadays, many of them will actually say that it was having a chemistry set as a child that sparked their interest in the science. I'm in search of our next hidden killer. The 1950s home had benefited from the technological developments of the war. There was a belief suffusing the age that science could transform everything. And it did. In the 1950s, there was a significant development in the understanding of the science of plastics and polymers. A Nobel Prize was awarded um, for uh, advances in macromolecular chemistry. Suddenly all of these things that weren't possible before became possible. Cheap, pliable, easily made, for better or worse, this was when our love affair with plastics began. So you have the hard and transparent plastic in the eye holes of the gas masks, and then you have these flexible foam toys, and then you had so many other different plastic objects. Plastics are made of polymers. The breakthrough was understanding that polymers are very large molecules. What's special about them is that different types of polymers can make hard or soft, flexible or rigid forms. So they can be manufactured into a range of products, from furniture to clothing. These objects that would previously have been luxury items now began to be mass-produced objects and available to ordinary people. There was, I suppose, a democratisation. It just made things uh, possible for the ordinary person. And they're looking forward to a brighter future and the, the future of plastics. One of the things that plastics could make were comfortable new polyurethane sofas. The perfect setting for the 1950s family to relax with a cigarette. These were the days when smoking was part of the background of everyday life. A combination which would prove to be particularly problematic. Verdicts of death by misadventure were recorded on three boys who died in a fire at their home on December 19th. The fire is believed to have been caused by a cigarette dropped onto a settee. A lighted cigarette ignited a settee. This accident was caused by a householder who fell asleep while smoking, an inexcusable practice. So Emma, we're not just hanging out in these lovely chairs in this yard for no reason. What are these about? Uh, these are uh, an example of uh, post-war 1950s style uh, furniture. In the post-war period, we began to use polyurethane forms. Uh, polyurethane forms are semi-rigid forms that allow a level of comfort without being permanently compressed, without being very hard. Um, so, and they allow for a number of different shapes and styles. So we needed this development in order to have this kind of change in design? Yes, yes we did. Polyurethane form sofas are much more comfortable than, than uh, the early sort of horsehair type and the hard back chairs that we, we used to have. So there, there was a big change at that point in time. But that big change came at a cost. That cost was realised by one unlucky couple. A 26-year-old Halifax man and his young wife escaped from a smoke-filled bedroom by climbing through a smashed window and down a rope of knotted sheets to the ground. The husband ran barefoot over 200 yards of rough track to his father-in-law's house to call the fire brigade. The fire is believed to have been caused by a cigarette end dropping onto a settee. 
plastic itself as a, as a singular form, um, it is flammable, but it's not overly flammable. You have to you know, really hold a light under it to get it going. It's the additive that you put with the plastic to turn it into um, like a polystyrene or into a foam for a mattress or foam for your settee. So it was usually the additive that was put into it, which was the flammable piece. That means that those forms and the materials that cover the chairs can be ignited by a cigarette or a match if you were to drop one and then they can burn very quickly and very freely. However, it's not just the fact that these materials caught fire easily, but how they burned that was the problem. The way that the polyurethane burns is actually in and of itself dangerous. So they, they, the foam forms a liquid and it runs down um, the material and to form a pool underneath and that pool becomes ignited. So you can have a flowing pool of burning liquid. It's almost like having a flammable liquid fire, like petrol, underneath your sofa. That's how bad it can be. But that wasn't the only issue. These substances can give off very toxic fumes. And in fact, if you were in a room with foam that was burning, the cyanide gas that was given off would kill you long before the flames or the heat would. It wasn't only the new plastic furniture that could cause a problem. Cheap and easy to wash plastic clothing caused a sensation when it burst into our wardrobes in the 1950s. Not dangerous in its own right, but in the post-war home environment, it could be lethal. Edna Cooper, aged 13, received burns when her nitrous caught fire and she was fatally burned. She stood in front of the open gas oven to keep warm while brewing tea for her invalid mother. There will have been open fires. There may have been electric fires, probably without good guards on them. Um, some little one-bar fires didn't have guards at all for a while. So certainly there was a lot of different opportunities to get yourself burned. Nora Rhodes, aged 85, died in hospital from burns and shock received from when her nightdress caught fire in front of an electric fire. Synthetic clothing, for example, when it starts to burn very dangerously, it melts. And so it's often the melting drops of plastic onto the skin that can cause really severe and deep burns. The January 1955 issue of Picture Post highlighted the dangers. There was a serious problem with youngsters, uh, particularly little girls, in front of the fire, wearing lovely frilly nighties, looking ever so sweet. Uh, trouble was, a spark might come out the fire, or they might lean a little bit too close, and whoosh, the nylon nightie would just go up in flames, leaving horrendous burns, or maybe even killing the child. 300 children and old people died each year from burns due to flammable materials which is something we would just not tolerate today. The Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents had a campaign to raise awareness. They had noticed the significant difference in the number of incidents between boys and girls. They had a suggestion. We wanted people to go over to wear pyjamas, which were much neater and tidier around the body, and of course to guard the fire. In October 1954, an Act of Parliament decreed gas and electric fires must be manufactured with a secure guard. And while furniture today is protected by fire retardant, there are no such rules for pyjamas. Now I'm going to the living room to find our next hidden killer. One of the luxury items that made its way into the house in the early 1950s was the television. 
The coronation in June 1953 was one of the first events to challenge the supremacy of radio. It turned a fledgling service into the beginning of the mass medium it is today. By 1956, there was a television in every second house. It was designed to fit into the room like a piece of furniture, and the family gathered around it. It's a cosy scene, but one that sometimes had deadly consequences. Mr. George Skipper, his wife, seven-year-old daughter and mother-in-law, escaped unhurt by climbing down a ladder after they were trapped in their burning home. The outbreak originated in a television set which had inadvertently been left switched on and had become overheated. Insufficient insulation in the loudspeaker of a television set caused the death of Victor Smith, aged four, in Kegworth. He was found dead near the set at his home. Some television models had not taken into account just how dangerous the combination of electrical wiring, wood, poor insulation and ventilation could be. The Home Secretary was forced to address the subject and announced... A new British standard specification for TV sets, including revised safety precautions in the light of recent experience, was nearing completion. Public enthusiasm, though, went from strength to strength. In 1959, 10 million television licenses were issued. The mass medium was here to stay. That's the TV sorted. Our next hidden killer could be anywhere in the house. Before the war, most people rented their homes. But during the 1950s, more people were able to buy, as wages grew at a faster rate than house prices. Many were in need of modernization. And it was almost impossible to get hold of tradesmen because most were tied up with reconstructing war-torn Britain. The only option was to do it yourself. And so an epidemic of home improvement gripped the nation. This was really the DIY generation. Dulux paint went on sale from 1953, Black & Decker started selling to the general public in 1954, and Practical Householder magazine went on sale from October 1955. For the happy householder with time and money on their hands and new materials and technologies at their fingertips, domestic utopia was within reach. The public were increasingly being exposed to all these wonderful things through new magazines and the magic of television. It was encouraged as a, as a family to get involved. It was like going for a walk in a park. You know, we, we'll redecorate the, 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 ba the bathroom or the, the lounge or we'll, we'll cut this door, we'll knock this down. And you were encouraged as a family to do it, as a family event. And why not? The family that DIYs together stays together. This is um, the first edition of Practical Householder. And if we take a look at the index, we'll see the range of things people could be doing at home by themselves. So we've got paper hanging, making rugs, concrete paths and floors. So there's an enormous range of... Building your own bungalow. I mean, that is <laughs> incredible. They're pretty ambitious, aren't they? Goodness me. They certainly were. People believed they could instill new life into their homes without professional help for a fraction of the price. But they were seemingly oblivious to the perils. The doyen of DIY, Barry Bucknell, was, after all, a reassuring presence. His television programmes on doing it yourself attracted, at their peak, over seven million viewers. He had the best TV show on in the 1950s, most watched. He was getting something in the region of 35,000 letters a week. He had six or eight secretaries working for him, just going through the envelopes. Uh, that is phenomenal. I don't know whether you've got a problem like this, a rather ugly old panel door. It's one that can be solved quite simply. You can make it look like this. You know, he's almost like a hero then, to get people into DMI and get up get going, change your house, get the light in there, get the colour on the walls and board up your staircase and paint it or pull that Victorian fireplace out and board it up. Uh, 
cover that Victorian door up with plywood and paint it and to transform your house to that, that one that you, you might have seen advertised, that brand new one. And it's looking already very much smoother. But he later became known to some as Bodger Bucknell. They saw his desire to strip out what he called clutter as the willful destruction of original features. So he was the driving force behind DIY, but also he caused great problems. I heard stories that, uh, that um, they reckon he destroyed more houses than a new father <laughs> because of his changes, his radical changes that he wanted to do in homes. And that, I think, has certainly changed the appearance of the door, but... But Barry was a professional. He knew what he was doing. His disciples, however, didn't necessarily have the experience or the skills. A loss of them feature DIY happening high up on ladders. Oh, gosh, yeah. So these look incredibly precarious. <laughs> yeah, this man is holding something very heavy. So it's all a bit of a disaster waiting to happen, isn't it? Although the magazines don't address health and safety, I think they must definitely, definitely have been aware of um, the dangers. So this is a um, comic strip that appears in a lot of them. And you can see he's on a set of ladders, painting, but then manages to fall through. Robert Wise, aged 29, died from injuries received in falling from a ladder while painting the upstairs window of his home. The ladder was too close to the wall and he had fallen backwards. Mrs. Agnes Hyde, aged 45, was killed when a ladder which her husband was lowering overbalanced and struck her on the head. But everyone knows that ladders can be treacherous. What they didn't know was that some of these products were toxic. Asbestos was used around the house and garage with lasting and hideous consequences. New, extra-strong adhesives could be harmful if inhaled. Now, this contact adhesive was pretty nasty stuff. I remember using it as a young apprentice. First time I used it, I think I spent most of the day floating about a foot off the floor. And the next day, I spent most of the time drinking water and trying to get my throat to calm down and my nostrils to calm down because it burnt all the inside of my nostrils and my throat. Uh, it was horrendous stuff. Manufacturers, realising the public's interest, produced a range of power tools for the DIY enthusiast. A potentially huge market compared to the professional trade. Electric drills were on sale for £5, available to buy in monthly instalments and advertised as the family favourite. The king of power tools was indeed a must for your home. But these boy toys could be dangerous. Mr Guy, aged 27, was found about 15 feet from his houseboat with the electric drill in his hand. Under the conditions in which it was used, in water, it became a lethal weapon. Had he been standing on dry land, he would not have had a shock. They were selling power tools, which professionals were used to using. But as you as a DIY expert had no training in whatsoever, but were expected to use. Not all power tools use the safety features we know today. If you're cutting something and perhaps you've gone into your own leg or you, you cut your fingers or whatever you've done, it doesn't automatically cut off as soon as you take your feet. You've got to actually look for the switch to turn it off. So the longer you're looking for it, the more damage it's doing to you. Nothing, it seemed, was out of bounds for the do-it-yourselfers. A young girl died of electrocution in her bathroom as she touched the electric warming towel rail while standing in the bath. Her father told the inquest into her death that he had installed the rail in the bathroom five years before. A faulty adapter failed to earth the appliance. Perhaps, Installing your own electric towel rail should not have been on the DIY list of jobs to do in the home. It was a bit of a problem because people were not necessarily very familiar with wiring. So you would get problems with things badly wired, plugs badly um, screwed in so that there were bits of wire hanging out the bottom and they weren't properly held so they would work free and then they could short or catch fire. Um, so there were some problems with electrocution and fire. 
Mr. Oliver of West Hartlepool Fire Service said many fires were started through faulty electrical wiring, which was often the work of the amateur electrician. The public were advised, when it came to electrics, don't do it yourself, use a professional. They were a lot smarter in those days. I can't imagine any electrician turning up looking like that now. I think I'd probably wonder if he was an electrician if he did. <laughs> but our passion for DIY has never waned. Our desire to restore and revitalise marches on, thanks to Bank Holidays and Barry. Thanks, Barry. I'm going to the kitchen now to find out how one apparently innocuous item of food caused mayhem in the post-war home. The kitchen became so important in this age because it moved from being a private space into a public one. It became a place to entertain guests. And so attention was paid to what this previously hidden room looked like. And of course, it was the woman's place in the home. In October 1955, in Woman's Own, it described the kitchen as the heart and centre of the meaning of home, the place where, day after day, you make with your hands the gifts of love. Fourteen years of food rationing finally came to an end on the 4th of July 1954, when restrictions on meat and bacon were lifted. Not surprisingly, life in the kitchen suddenly became a whole lot more fun. And gifts of love abounded. It means, of course, that people are able to get more foodstuffs, a wider range of things, and they're able freely to go out and buy um, as much as they want. So they can really um, indulge, if you like, on buying you know, as much butter um, as they want to after having really sort of had to live by their ration books for a very long time. People were excited about the new possibilities with food, and into this gap came cookery writers. Writers like Elizabeth David and Marguerite Patton infused food with passion. Tastes were changing, quite literally, and demand for meat in particular went through the roof. The ideal for the British family is to have a roast Sunday joint, a, a beef or possibly lamb. But what happens after 1955 or so is that, you know, gradually chicken is brought into the British diet to a much greater extent. Livestock, like cattle, could simply not be reared quickly enough in the numbers needed to satisfy demand. Chickens, however, could. Chickens had accounted for only 1% of British meat consumption in 1950. But now its moment had arrived thanks to a revolution in modern British agriculture. Intensive rearing and factory farming were introduced, and the resulting cheap chicken meat transformed the British diet. So in 1954, five million table chickens were available for consumption in this country, and by 1959, it's 75 million. Feeding an extra 70 million birds was a colossal undertaking and one that could only be achieved by importing grain from other countries. Problem solved then, wasn't it? In the process of feeding birds and indeed livestock, we are also bringing in imported artificial feeds like ground meat, and these come carrying already a bacterial load. So what you see is that these birds and indeed livestock are being fed salmonella-contaminated food. So the chickens were infected by what they were eating. And the intensive conditions in which they were kept, processed and packaged, aggravated the matter. And then they landed in the post-war kitchen, bread, dead, and ready to be roasted. An analysis of outbreaks of food poisoning showed that the largest number occurred in the home. Many outbreaks were due to insufficient knowledge by housewives. Why was this? 
The post-war period is the time at which domestic service really disappears from the middle-class homes. So middle-class women um, sometimes feel rather hard done by because um, they're having to fend for themselves and do most of the household work and labour for themselves. And of course this might create more problems in the kitchen because of course they would have been obliged to take primary responsibility for cooking and feeding the family, which they may have found difficult if they'd been brought up in a home where all that work had been done by servants. The housewife plays a cardinal role in this story, partly because she is the person who handles the chicken in the house. The hapless housewife, twas ever thus, tasked with putting food in the mouths of her family, not realising that tonight's supper is already a heaving mass of bacteria, then inadvertently upped the ante even further. Well into the 50s, you can still buy chicken. Sometimes they are what's called New York dressed, which means that they've got all their guts left in intact. Um, they quite often come still with their heads attached, and the housewife would expect to deal with that at home. She might or might not wash chicken when she gets it home, and she might well not wash her own hands when she'd finished handling the bird. And as such, she was accidentally spreading this hidden killer throughout the home. I've come to Matthew Averson's laboratory to find out what the post-war chicken-cooking housewife didn't know about salmonella. Because salmonella is too deadly to use in this experiment, Matthew has contaminated some chicken with a similar, though thankfully for me, less lethal bacteria. I'm going to show four different ways of cleaning my hands after handling the chicken, so we can demonstrate just how pernicious this bacteria was. So what I want you to do is just touch the chicken and then we're going to make an imprint of your fingers on this uh, indicator plate. OK. The first time, I don't clean my hands at all. And then I'll just lift the lid and you just put your fingers onto the surface. After the second time of handling the chicken, I wipe my hands with a paper towel. Hmm. Not sure this will do the trick. It makes it feel less slimy, but actually, yes. practically... Yes, yeah, so when you're touching the meat, it feels slimy, but that's not actually the bacteria, that's just the meat. You don't feel the bacteria. After the third time of touching the chicken, I wash my hands in lovely, clean water. And lastly, I touch the chicken, then wash thoroughly with soap and water. It actually takes a huge number of bacteria to infect somebody, particularly if you're healthy, between about a million and a billion bacteria. But you can't see them, and so the food that you're eating may look, smell and taste completely normal. OK, Matthew, let's see some results then. OK, so these are some plates that have been incubated overnight, and this is the first one. So this is with the unwashed hands. So this is just after touching uh, the bacteria. The darker colours uh, are the bacteria. There are so many bacteria on here, you can't see individual colonies, individual spots. There are yeah. literally thousands and thousands of bacteria on each Ooh. finger. After rinsing your hands under the tap though, that's just simply the act of washing the bacteria down the sink. We're not killing the bacteria at all. Mm. You're actually making some significant strides to reducing the numbers. There's still quite a few bacteria, but you can see individual colonies. The biggest difference of all, though, comes from using soap, which doesn't kill the bacteria. What soap does is it just improves the ability of us to wash away the bacteria from our skin. So there are still some bacteria. Matthew estimates that simply wiping your hands reduces the level of contamination by maybe 10 times, while washing your hands with soap reduces contamination by probably 100,000 times. So in short, if they brought meat into the house that had been contaminated in this way and did anything with it and then didn't wash their hands really thoroughly, yeah. it could get everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Not only into your mouth, but also onto the other food that you're preparing, onto the surfaces around you, onto your utensils. Onto your children. Onto your children, absolutely. If somebody eats salmonella-infected food, it between a day and two days after eating it, um, you'll start to develop symptoms, and those are likely to be things like diarrhea, abdominal pain and cramps, and possibly vomiting. 
Most people who develop salmonella food poisoning would recover within five to seven days. Um, it would be unpleasant, uh, but they wouldn't need any particular treatment. But if you're particularly young, say babies and young children, or old, or if your immune system is suppressed for any other reason, perhaps you've got cancer or some other disease, then you're much more susceptible to really severe infection. And in that case, it's possible that the bacterium could get into the bloodstream and then spread around the body, and then it could affect other areas such as the brain and cause meningitis, which could, could be fatal, or a septicemia, a blood poisoning. Today, 60 years later, intensive farming conditions have improved, and successive public health campaigns have resulted in a better understanding of food hygiene in the home. There's no reason why you should be at risk from this particular hidden killer nowadays. Is there? I'm off to find our next hidden killer in the bathroom. Amazingly, in 1950, half of all homes had no indoor bathroom. So one of the pivotal changes of this decade was the introduction of this luxurious new room. For the first time, people of all classes were able to have an indoor bathroom. And a surge of interest in bathroom furnishings reflected this rapidly expanding market. This new attitude was summarised in House and Garden magazine at the time. A bathroom is a place to rest your morale, as well as your looks. Bathing became an enjoyable experience, and one to be taken in pleasant, rather than spartan surroundings. It was a far cry from the old tin bath in front of the fire. But why was it not all that it seemed? In order to understand this, we have to go outside the home and look at an unrelated killer. Air pollution was responsible for an unforgettable event in the early 50s, which led to a major change in how our homes were heated. We've always had environmental pollution, but it particularly became important in December of 1952, when we had the Great Smog in London. It was said that you couldn't see your feet because the smog was so thick. Um, and it would have been not like the sort of fog that we all understand. It would have been a thick, yellowy-brown smelly, horrible um, sort of fog. It would make it be very difficult for you to breathe. And the egg smell is from sulphur dioxide, which would combine with water to form sulfuric acid. The rise in deaths was greater than in the worst week of the cholera epidemic in 1866. Records show that about 4,000 people died from the smog although more recently calculations made that up to 12,000 um, and about 100,000 became ill because of it. This nightmarish episode produced more civilian casualties in Britain than any single event of the entire Second World War and was the catalyst for replacing coal fires in the home. And here's the rub. It had been a very cold winter and there was lots of snow on the ground and so people were burning coal in their homes to try to keep warm. But the weather conditions at the time meant that there was an anti-cyclone and that pushed air back down towards the earth and so the smoke was trapped. Legislation was introduced to prevent the murderous coal fumes and... A virtual ban on the open coal fire in hundreds of thousands of houses in big industrial areas can be ordered by local councils. As homes became less reliant on coal fires, gas appliances were introduced, and into the bathroom came gas boilers and heaters. In the early 1950s, they brought into the bathroom to produce hot water for your, for your bath. There was a self-contained boiler. Turn the little tap on, and you just empty it into your bath and obviously jump in and enjoy it. What could be more pleasurable? But there's a problem when you bring a gas boiler into a small enclosed space. A fireman broke down the door of a gas-filled bathroom and found a 20-year-old nurse slumped in the bath. 
the pathologist said death was due to carbon monoxide poisoning. To burn one cubic metre of gas, you need around 10 cubic metres of fresh air full of oxygen. The problem occurs when you haven't got enough oxygen. So if you're in a cramped place, the windows are sealed, try and keep the heat in, then the gas will burn to form carbon monoxide. And this is very toxic. Carbon monoxide is produced by the incomplete burning of fossil fuels. It is dangerous when the boiler is insufficiently sealed and the toxic gases are allowed back into the room rather than exhausted to the atmosphere. You were in that nice new shiny fitted bathroom. You'd got your door shut, your window shut to keep the drafts out and you're just sitting there absorbing all this carbon monoxide. You think you're getting nice and relaxed because of the hot water and it's not, it's the carbon monoxide which is slowly putting you to sleep. Forensic fire expert Emma Wilson has designed an experiment to show me just how quickly this silent, deadly gas can be produced in a sealed environment. She will use butane gas in a sealed tank to simulate a bathroom with a gas boiler in it. In the corner of the tank is a modern-day carbon monoxide detector alarm that we use in our homes today. Now, if you will help me pop this on the top so that we can seal the gas in. As if we're closing if, the door of our bathroom? Exactly. OK, how are we going to do that? Just by burning that flame in a sealed environment, we're going to produce a deadly gas? Yes, we are. The, as the combustion of the gas becomes less efficient because there's less oxygen, we produce more and more carbon monoxide. When gas burns normally, two oxygen molecules attach to it, making carbon dioxide. When there is less oxygen available, the gas can only attach to one molecule, making carbon monoxide, a toxic gas. In addition, the steam from the hot bath interferes with the ability of the flame to burn correctly. And in a sealed room, once the oxygen is used up, it is not replaced. It took just three minutes for the carbon monoxide detector alarm to be activated. The sealed tank is now full of poisonous gas. That's the detector sounding to let us know that carbon monoxide in that compartment is now at a dangerous level. Right, so nowadays we have, you can put in a detector and you can know about it. Yes. And it's, you know, pretty sh shrieking, but apart from the sound that's telling us it's there, we haven't got any smell, we haven't got any obvious signs of it. No, none. Gosh, so you could be sitting there in that bath, in your lovely bath, and you shut the doors and windows, you're having time to yourself, your boiler's going, and it's producing this gas that could make you sick and could kill you. Yes. I mean, I'm just I'm starting to run away by the fact that it's just completely invisible. Henry Payne, age 41, was found dead in a bath at his home. He probably inhaled the carbon monoxide first, then slipped into the water. There is no official supervision over installation of gas geysers, the borough coroner was told. When it's inhaled, our haemoglobin, which is the substance in the blood that carries oxygen from our lungs to all of our tissues where it's needed, the affinity for carbon monoxide is over 200 times more than the affinity for oxygen, which is what that haemoglobin should be carrying. So it means if there's carbon monoxide in the air that you breathe in, it will bind to the haemoglobin. When that haemoglobin passes round to the tissues, it doesn't release any oxygen present, and it doesn't release the carbon monoxide, and so your tissues start to be starved of oxygen. And it's really like suffocating the body from the inside. It was colourless, tasteless and odourless, the absolute definition of a hidden killer. At low doses, carbon monoxide can cause headaches, flu-like symptoms, confusion and dizziness. Um, but if you have a lot of carbon monoxide, it can be rapidly fatal and stop the heart because your entire body is starved of oxygen. The heating apparatus in the bathroom was criticised at a Dundee inquiry into the death of Peter Moran, aged 25, who was found dead by his father. Police surgeon Dr Dorwood said, the method of heating water for a bathroom is a very dangerous one because of the bad vent. 
Over the decades, gas appliances have improved, and it is understood that if they are incorrectly installed or not regularly serviced, there can be fatal consequences. Still today, legislation only governs landlords. Homeowners themselves are responsible for keeping their houses safe from this toxic gas. Gas safe regulations cover the installation of boilers in bathrooms, but even so, there are still around 4,000 cases of carbon monoxide poisoning and 40 deaths every year in Britain. My school friend was one of them. My final hidden killer can be found all over the house, but I'm going in search of the kitchen variety, into the heart of the woman's domain. We have seen how men and their power tools came a cropper. Now we see how the newly on-tap electricity brought considerable danger into the shiny world of appliances. The magazines are full of adverts showing women breezily vacuuming their houses 